Thank you. It's a way bigger auditorium than <laughs> for the size of uh, of the room, so it's um, it's uh, hopefully we can make it a little bit more intimate in the in the um, Q and A section. Um, when I started in this space, in the sort of existential risk, global catastrophic risk space a few years ago, 2019, I went over to CESA and spent a couple months there doing some uh, policy research. Um, I think I, I definitely, uh, and over the subsequent years, I, I think I've definitely underestimated or didn't realise the level of um, uh, scepticism or at least sort of pushback on the idea of sort of doing policy work in in the sort of broader space, and, and not, that's not necessarily a bad thing, it's just something that I hadn't really sort of uh, really uh, clocked on to early on, and, and um, you know, this, even the discussion and the panel discussion we had yesterday around policy, it's, it's definitely a theme that runs through a lot of the discussion in, in, the, in the community, particularly sort of the GCR X risk field of studies around what are the risks and what are the challenges of, of policy work. Um, so what I wanted to do today was sort of flip the script a little bit and let's talk about policy success. Let's, let's sort of frame it in a positive way and see, well, what are the, what, um, how should we think about policy success generally and but, but specifically for, for existential risk? So, and, and, and so what I'm going to really focus on today is a bit of a framework um, to, to think about policy success and, and, how, and sort of start to think about a few examples where we can apply this. So policy success, it's, it's sort of a very uh, a, a vague term in a sense, um, and, and actually if you really think about it, it's, it's pretty much almost impossible to d define in a specific context what do we actually mean by policy su success. So let's, let's sort of take a step back and think about well, what is policy initially, um, and in its sort of simplest sense, it's a political intention um, turning into, manifesting into practice. Um, how that, what the political intention is and how it manifests into practice is why it becomes so difficult to achieve, assess, and, then, and, and really ultimately define what policy success looks like. Um, especially in the current sort of global environment when policy is rolled out, government policy is rolled out, you know, it often interacts with complex systems, economic systems, environmental systems, social systems. So, you know, how do you know what the actual impacts are? You might understand your first level impact, but the the sort of um, roll-on effects, the second and third order consequences are really hard to um, estimate and, and even necessarily um, understand um, as they happen. And success also depends on uh, who's impacted, how, how they're impacted and how they even feel they're impacted. Sometimes what happened to them and how, how they feel is very different as well. So policy success is, is you know, almost an impossible term in both, in, in a sense of how to define it and how to assess it. Um, and, you know, I, I really like this sort of broad way to think about policies. There's no solutions, only trade-offs. And that really gives you a sense of how hard it is to, to think about policy success, because you might only think about, well, we achieved X, Y, and Z, but you don't necessarily realise the, the downside impacts or the things that you had to trade off as a result. I think it's even more difficult in an existential risk context because we will, we don't have the single data point they will need to to know if we achieve success, right? If if at the end of the day, policy around existential risk is ultimately about avoiding a, a, a risk of uh, an existential catastrophe from happening. Well, we don't want to wait for that to happen to know if we succeeded or not. Um, and you sort of don't know if how will you ever know really if we've, we never have an existential or global catastrophic risk, how do you then really know in the absence of that data point whether your policies really um, actually work? So it's really, it's actually really hard to know how your policy, particularly in this space, is really going to be, um, really going to happen. Um, so, and, and, and I think going back to that sort of complex system thing, how do we know, even if we even if we were to know, yes, that policy did reduce X or Y risk, well, what trade-offs did you make in that process um, and what, were those trade-offs necessarily worth it or, 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 um, or even understanding that those trade-offs happen? So it's, it's, it's just a really difficult space. So I think in that context, we sort of think about, well, we can't necessarily be outcome-driven it's hard to be outcome driven around policy success because we, we will never know in a sense um, 
how, where, whether that outcome was achieved, that outcome being avoiding existential risk. So I like to think about policy success more as the ingredients or the inputs to achieving successful policy. So um, this is just a very simple, uh, but I think very uh, effective way to think about and frame policy success. Um, this framework, and I'll go through a little bit more detail around each of these, um, there's, there's been actually surprisingly few studies on policy success. There's a few uh, pieces of work that's been done around a particularly case study analysis of when uh, policy success was achieved and what were the ingredients or what were the um, inputs into achieving that. And sort of pulling that together, those different studies, using my own sort of experience and, and uh, contextualizing it around existential risk. These are sort of four key ingredients that are needed to achieve policy success. Policy success. So first around the empirically sound analysis and reasoning. I think in the, as we were saying earlier, the risk policy is really hard to know how your, um, how your policy achieved that outcome um, because it's really the absence of, a, of an event that you're trying to avoid. And so evidence-based policy might be going to be potentially a very high bar to try and reach when it comes to uh, existential risk policy. But that doesn't mean you, know, you can't provide some empiric uh, basis and reasoning and analysis to support that, whether that's case studies, whether that's um, uh, trial and error of existing policy, whether that's sort of minor events of, of, um, of risk that help um, uh, help you identify how that policy um, really works or doesn't work. And I think you know, a, a good way, at least to start to think about that theory of impact is, well, if risk is a threat or a hazard meeting a vulnerability, well, how does the policy specifically reduce the threat or the hazard? And how does that policy specifically reduce the vulnerability or, or increase our resilience to, to vulnerability? And you know, let's, let's sort of make this a little bit more specific. Let's take AI risk as an example. Um, I see sort of there's roughly, let's say, four pathways to AI risk, um, AI GCRX risk, let's say amplifying other risks, particularly uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear war, malicious use of AI, accidental um, applications of AI, and superintelligence. Well, you know, what do we, what, how does the policy you're looking to implement actually reduce any one of those specific pathways? Or from a vulnerability perspective, AI um, might exacerbate um, or weaken, sorry, some of the uh, systems that underpin our, um, our society, economic systems, governance systems. And if AI helps, uh, well, exacerbates those vulnerabilities to the point where we might be vulnerable to other risks, again, thinking it through a vulnerability sense, how does the policy you're looking to implement reduce those vulnerabilities? So at least starting there, you start going, okay, I need to start tracing the, the specific policy I'm implementing to the specific threat, hazard, or vulnerability that I'm trying to reduce. And starting to do that chain, I, I find that a lot of the policy ideas in the space, um, it's hard to know what that theory of impact exactly is and how exactly do you see that policy manifesting into, into a lower or, re, or reduced risk. Policy design and implementation, that's um, how you go about um, formulating the, pol the policy itself. What are the, what are the tools and instruments you're using to implement the policy? You know, this is all about, this is all under the sort of um, banner of policy design and implementation. And, how you go about that and how you design the policy is going to be critical to its success. Um, the, the first step in any of that is a policy problem. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? That might be different to the research problem or um, the sort of social problem. A policy problem is, a very, is, is defined in the policy space. So what is the problem you're trying to solve for and how are the instruments or the tools you're using actually going to uh, solve for that problem? I find my sort of policy experiences, from my policy experience, the policy problem has been the, often the um, first step people have gone wrong. If you haven't defined the problem well enough, you're not going to develop the solutions um, that are going to be effective for that. And so let's just say, again, in the AI case, let's say malicious use of AI, 
Um, what's the policy problem there? What, what, are you, what are you trying to solve for? What, is it a security challenge? Is it a uh, law enforcement challenge? Is it a legal challenge? Like, what is a specific policy uh, gap that you're trying to solve for? And what instrument are you going to use to, to, um, to resolve that gap? And I think part of the, this implementation challenge as well is the complex systems that we're, um, we engage in. So those feedback loops of your policy, the um, the unintended consequences, those are going to be key implementation challenges. And if there's any other problem I've seen in my experience is when you're designing the policy, it's very, the, the implementation almost becomes, um, doesn't be, it doesn't get considered at all. It's just, this is what the policy is, this is what we want to implement, and now it's over to some random bureaucrats to actually deliver it. But that's a key part of designing good policy is understanding the implementation challenges and designing um, mitigations to those, uh, to those implementation challenges. Policy delivery um, and implementation is, it, it, it's critical to have ownership, accountability and coordination. If a specific part of government or a really a specific political leader does not have ownership over that policy, it's going to be very difficult to have success because if no one owns it, it doesn't get, um, it doesn't get delivered well. I see this as a, a good example of this, in, to my mind, in an Australian context, is food policy. Um, food, you know, you naturally think, oh, Department of Agriculture, they own sort of food-related stuff. But once you sort of break it down, you go, well, Department of Health owns the nutrition aspect, um, agriculture owns um, the, the agricultural farming aspects, um, home affairs is responsible for biosecurity, you know, pests and diseases coming into the country. Then you have uh, treasury and the finance parts of government looking at taxation and GSTs around. So you, you break this one policy down, this one area down, and you go, so many parts of government own this one policy. And I would argue we have really not very good food policy in this country, um, as you can see through the climate change effects or the food waste effects or the health impacts. Um, and I think a critical part of that, or a critical reason for that, is that no one actually owns food policy. And then you have states have, and territories have their own approach. Um, you know, cities and localities have their own approach. So not having that clear ownership and responsibility means that really it doesn't get delivered well. And I mean, I, 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 I really, um, I think food policy should be one of those things. I don't bring it up as a, just a random example. I actually think it should be part of the conversation about the work that we do because food policy matters for climate change. It matters for resilience to catastrophes. And in a broader EA context, it matters for animal welfare. So I think food policy is a really good example of, and it's not just in Australia that this happens. In many other countries, particularly um, uh, countries that have a lot of uh, agricultural output, uh, the agriculture part of the bureaucracy owns, so to speak, food, um, and it, it becomes one of these really um, dispersed policy issues. I think AI policy is going to, going to go this way, if not has already gone this way, where you have, it's such a um, impactful technology um, that every part of government is going to have some relationship with AI, and it's not just going to be a tech policy issue, um, it's going to be something that, uh, that you know, security and defense establishments will want to own a part of, the industry portfolios want to have a part of. So, you know, I think AI policy is going to be, this is going to be a real challenge for AI policy I see is who is going to own and um, drive and coordinate uh, the, um, the specific policy outcomes. And the final component is about how policies sustain and evolve over the long term. I think this is not, uh, this is an issue for any type of policy, but I think it's particularly relevant for existential risk, given the time frames we're talking about, and given that we want governments to maintain their focus on these issues over the long time frame. We don't want them to lose interest or patience or focus just because it hasn't happened, right? Um, if anything, we want them to, to maintain and, in, and increase that, that focus and interest in spite of it not happening. As we were saying earlier, it's the absence of an outcome we're trying to avoid. And so if anything, you know, by, by the policy success is displayed by it not happening. So um, maintaining that focus is going to be a real, uh, a real challenge. And, you know, an example of this uh, potentially is something like 
the National Risk Assessment in the UK, one of the earliest countries that started a process like this, uh, in 2004 is when they first launched it and it's got, gone through multiple iterations, multiple sort of reviews and processes. And even more recently, it's gone up, come under very heavy criticism for not picking up on a COVID-19 level sort of pandemic. Um, but in spite of its not working in that context, they have, the government hasn't gone, well, let's not even use that process anymore, let's dispense with it. They've gone, okay, they've, um, how do we improve on this? How do we grow it into an even uh, better policy and, uh, and, and, and process? And so there's reviews in the House of Lords, there's internal reviews in the UK government looking at improving the national risk assessment so that it can pick up on, on these issues. And you know, it, by, having, by having that process there, it, it, it enables uh, that sort of feedback process, it gets tested in new context, it's get, it gets tested by real, real world events, and then there's a process to come, come back and, and improve it and, and develop on it. In contrast, in Australia, we don't even have a national risk assessment to criticise for not picking up on COVID-19. So it's hard to evolve and sustain a, a, a policy that doesn't exist. So let's take, a, let's take this to the next level and sort of talk through a specific case study um, because I want to sort of, I've shared a few examples, but I want to sort of take, the, take each of these steps to the next level and, and start talking about how can we apply this sort of thinking and this framework. So the first part around empirically sound reasoning and analysis. Um, so the, in, in, in the US, uh, NASA um, started their, in, in, um, properly started their, asteroid detection program in the late 90s. Um, this grew out of, of a number of processes, but what really triggered it initially was the scientific consensus that was forming around the extinction of the dinosaurs and the scientific um, uh, consensus around the size and imp the, the impact of different sizes of, of asteroids. And there was a number of uh, scientific investigations, some of which prompted by Congress, um, and, and done and conducted or, or engaged with by NASA that really helped shape the policy uh, context and give evidence that, hey, this is an issue um, that we really need to think about. So empirically sound basis for policy impact. There was a tick there. The policy problem and the solution. Well, the policy problem is sort of self-evident. We don't want an asteroid to collide with Earth and there's... Um, there's uh, um, measures that we can take to detect that from happening and potentially deflect it from happening. Um, so the problem's quite clear. And uh, as far as uh, um, outer space sort of um, related endeavours go, it's actually relatively, a uh, relatively sort of easy um, uh, program to implement. I, I, I'm not an expert on, on it, but I, I um, uh, spoke to a NASA expert and who, who was sort of talking about this and uh, that's what they claim, so I'll take their, their advice on this. So from a sort of problem set um, perspective and from a solution set perspective, it's pretty clear what needs to be done. And from a, co a cost is one of those aspects of design and implementation. Um, the cost as well is not particularly prohibitive. So originally, uh, asteroid detection work that was done in NASA in the early 90s, that was about one, one to $1.5 million budget. They would mostly give that to observatories and other organizations to conduct that. Um, when they brought that in-house, uh, it became a $4 million program initially in 1998. And at the, at the time, a, a very small part of the NASA budget. So, you know, it, it made sense from a um, implementation perspective to go, yes, we should devote a very small percentage of our funds to, to this, and that's only, only grown over time. So policy design and implementation tick, I would say. Ownership, accountability, and, and coordination. I think it, it's sort of uh, almost self-evident that uh, uh, the, the organization uh, government organization that's responsible for outer space or, um, uh, is, is responsible for, for a program like this. So NASA has always been the, the key lead and they own a, and have developed a outer space, uh, sorry, national earth, uh, near earth object preparing a strategy and action plan. So they own that, they coordinate that across government. So there's 10 or 12 agencies across government that they get together to coordinate that, particularly with Department of Homeland Security. So there's clear ownership and responsibility around this. Um, and uh, if, if uh, obviously they own the budget that goes around it, um, and if political leaders or, um, or the public have someone they can point to and say, you're responsible, it's very clear who that is. 
So ownership, accountability, and coordination tick. And in terms of how this program has grown and evolved over time, I think a really, uh, I don't know if this was um, thought through initially, but at least by starting really small, I mean, $4 million for asteroid detection is not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, um, uh, particularly, as I said, in the $14 billion budget that was uh, NASA had at the time. But they started really small with a, with a meaningfully objective goal, which at the time was to track 90% of uh, asteroids over one kilometre in diameter by 2005, I think the goal was. Uh, and they essentially smashed that out of the park. And so when that when they came close to and achieved that goal, then it was, okay, what's the next goal we're looking to achieve? And by that, by that point, there was enough research to indicate the, um, the impact of, of asteroids and near-Earth objects of the size of 400 uh, meters across, and, which is essentially sort of continent-destroying uh, level asteroids. And so then the, then the legislation was changed to go, okay, now your job is to detect um, 90 or 99% of asteroids are 400 meters and greater by 2020. I, they haven't reached that goal, but they're getting meaningfully close. So by starting small, by achieving that goal, um, by, by de obviously developing the expertise and the experience um, and the, the trust of policymakers that they were able to achieve that goal, it's, it, goal, it's grown from, there, from then on. They've even grown into other techniques for de de detecting asteroids. So they repurposed the space-based capability that was going to be decommissioned um, uh, because it, it, it's very hard to um, achieve that 99% goal by just using ground-based capability. So they've launched new capabilities and now they're starting to think about deflection. So originally, well, the, most of the program was around detection and now they're starting to think about deflection and, and, and have launched um, just recently uh, a program to, to start testing that capability. So it's growing from strength to strength and, and um, from what was a four uh, million out of $14 billion budget is now a getting to a $200 million budget out of I think a $20, $25 billion total NASA budget. So you know even in the context of NASA's work, it's grown. So starting small and, and with that achievable goal, it's uh, that, that the program was set up to succeed. So policy longevity and evolution, the tick as well. Just want to close. Um, I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So um, just wanted to sort of close with a few sort of prompting questions. Well, I guess when people are thinking about how, to, how do I get involved, I mean, uh, there might be policy people in this room or people who want to shape policy. Um, you know, I think as particularly as people who are external potential, I mean, I, I assume external to the policy making here, um, that doesn't mean we can't assist in that policy delivery uh, process and really ultimately help government achieve policy success. And, you know, these are the sorts of questions that come to mind when um, I, I want us to think about achieving policy success. I won't run through all of them, but, and I've sort of, this is just a sort of summary of the sorts of things we've already covered. Um, but when you sort of go, go away and you're looking to develop policy proposals or reviewing policy, policy um, wh whether existing or, um, uh, or being proposed. You know, these are the sorts of things I really want people to focus on because you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, policy success is going to be really hard to achieve on existential risk. There are, um, uh, and and we, by focusing on the inputs as opposed to necessarily just the output, I think we're going to set us up, uh, set us, ourselves up and governments up for success. That's it from me, and now open to questions. Uh, thank you, Rumpton. I think that was a fantastic talk. So we've had a couple of questions come through on the swap card. Uh, I've got a couple of questions of my own, so um, I'm sure we, well, we won't run out of questions, is what I'm saying. Um, if you'd like to ask a question yourself, just like feel free to raise your hand at any point. We can, um, like, if you'd like to like speak about it, then give you that opportunity. Um, so we've got a question in here. For those in the audience interested in going into policy areas, working on EA related issues, what do you recommend as the best way to build career capital or experience and credibility in the policy, policy space? For example, do you think that um, MPP, Master of Public Policy, I think, degrees are valuable or not necessary, or is research and government experience a better way to go? And I might just add to that as well, uh, do you think it's better to get experience outside of this space 
for, is that a necessary condition or would one be able to perhaps like go straight into this space after university? Um, yeah, I mean, personally, I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more in favor of sort of experience and diving in than, than um, sort of studies and academic sort of uh, approaches. I mean, as someone who did a master's of public policy, I'm slightly maybe cynical on that because I went into my interviews, my first interviews with government and uh, never did they ask about my master's of public policy, never did I apply it. So it did, didn't seem at least initially relevant. It's not to say it's not a good thing to do. Um, and I think... Uh, um, I'm glad I did it because it gave me uh, a better sense of um, policy stakeholders and policy processes and, and sort of um, uh, triggered in me the desire to, to go into government. So for that purpose, it was definitely really important. But all the experience and all the sort of insights I've gained from policy has been from entering. And in terms of building career capital, um, you know, one thing I like to emphasize is, I mean, it's obviously going to be very dependent on the specific issue that you care about. Um, personally, I think um, strategic pol areas that do strategic policy are the most valuable to, to get into, at least to sort of most quickly upskill yourself. And by strategic policy, it's really talking about those parts of government um, and the political establishment that develop the policy thinking and de make the deci decisions around policy thinking. So working in a minister's office or an MP's office, working in department of prime minister and cabinet where you're seeing policy come through um, every day and your, your job is to assess, the, assess those policy proposals, um, advise uh, your seniors and including the PM about those policy. The, um, that's definitely a space. Even the strategic policy areas within specific departments um, might be a useful space as well. So I think definitely uh, those have, have been um, really, and maybe I'm speaking a little, obviously from my own experience, having done that, having worked in PMNC and, and done that strategic policy thinking, that's definitely been really powerful. But I think it's really powerful because when you come back out, um, that's the sort of stuff you're going to be advising on. When you're, if you're writing, if you work for a think tank or, or go into a, a research organisation to do policy work, you're essentially going to be doing strategic policy uh, thinking and strategic policy research and strategic policy advice, um, I think, more than necessarily like the nuts and bolts of uh, policy implementation. So um, if there's a place to build career capital, I definitely think that's a really useful space. Unless, of course, you have a very specific... Um, uh, sort of area that you're really focused on, like if you're, you know, um, really keen on foreign aid, well, then it's going to really make sense to go and work for DFAT and on a specific aid program and see how that's run and implemented and you can build your capital in that. So, I mean, but that's a sort of more self-evident one. I think the one that I didn't appreciate before I went into government was the more strategic policy parts of government. Great. Uh, thank you. So, one thing that I was thinking about when I was listening to you speak, so ultimately it's the politicians who are able to pass legislation and get policy enacted. Through your time, I guess, trying to advise and advocate for more existential risk policy, how have you found the kind of um, political landscape surrounding it? How, how amenable are the people you talk to um, about existential risk policy? Do they think it's um, like an important thing that they should definitely start working on? Do they think it's... Um, do they think it's kind of nonsense? And, and also, has it, has it managed to become partisan yet? Or is it still, uh, I don't know, I always get confused between partisan and nonpartisan. Is it like, is it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, to be fair, I haven't done uh, that like really direct policy advocacy myself. So I'm going to speak more on how I've, uh, what I've heard from my colleagues and counterparts in other um, parts of the world who have done it um, and speak sort of more broadly. I think one thing to, one thing that's been definitely a focus of the, has been not necessarily framing it, and I think it's a, there's a good argument not to frame it in an existential risk context. We can frame it in other contexts um, for, and for other uh, for other purposes. So, like if you if you want to talk about um, pandemics, I mean, you don't need to use existential risk. If you want to talk about AI, particularly, you might want to completely avoid talking about existential risk. Um, I think there's other contexts we can use or other um, uh, other avenues and, and sort of approaches. For example, I think like the governments, their main focuses are the economy and security. So, and if we can frame it in those contexts, that potentially becomes a, a really sort of powerful sort of avenue. Um, and obviously, if, if, if it's something that the public doesn't care about is going to be very difficult to um, uh, difficult to get 
political leaders to care about as well. So framing it in, in terms that they specifically are focused on in, in something that their local sort of um, electorate cares about. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, about six months ago or so, Andrew Lee, which I'm sure everyone uh, um, knows, um, and had released his book and he was doing a talk, I think on this stage, uh, about, um, about, and I asked him, my question to him was, how have you gone speaking about um, uh, existential risk with your colleagues? And uh, he, I, th I think he was trying to avoid saying, I haven't spoken to them about it, but I, th I think he was essentially saying like, I, you know, I, I, uh, I think he was alluding to the fact that he was t he t you tailor it to the audience, right? Like, if you, if, you know, we don't have to talk existential risk at large, but you can talk climate change, you can talk AI, or you can talk um, biosecurity, whatever the, whatever the challenge might be. So, I, you know, as a very broad sort of principle, I think is about framing it in the right context, because at the moment we don't necessarily have the um, political appetite or the bandwidth to, to talk these sort of really long-term or uncertain futures. Yep, no, that makes a lot of sense. Um, another question from the audience. Do you have ideas on how to form an empirically sound basis for a theory of change for AI policy? Uh, not off the top of my head, I guess, but um, I, think, I think it's a, I mean, my main, uh, let's say, issue, or well, not issue, but sort of the gap I would like to see solved for is much more clear pathways of how we go from now to existential risk. For each of the risks, down, like for each of the macro risks and each of the sort of, let's say, micro risks, so, so to speak, or pathways or scenarios. So let's say those four pathways for AI that I had earlier, each of those can be broken down into their own respective pathways. So when we say malicious use of AI, well, who specifically is being malicious? Is it um, uh, organizations? Is it individuals? What's the, what's the reasoning for, um, or, or motivation for each of those groups? And then how do you design the policy for each of those? So I think one thing we need to do is really break down, this is a research problem as much as a policy one, is break down each of the macro risks down to really concrete pathways. This happens and then this happens and this happens and then you can start building interventions for each of those. Um, and I think once we start doing that, you'll start seeing the significant overlap of potential overlap with existing policy. So potentially, you know, what we're doing for, I don't know, maybe for terrorists is going to be applicable to for malicious use of AI or for malicious use of um, synthetic biology, right? So you, there's going to be some overlap there or um, the the sort of maybe the geopolitical um, uh, dynamics around technology might be another... Um, they're not necessarily doing it around AI or, or the technology risk that we're facing, but that becomes another sort of pathway to see policy change on the issues we care about. But it really comes down to breaking each of the risks down at their most sort of uh, practical and fundamental level. And, and there's been a bit of work, like particularly nuclear has, nuclear studies have done that, right? They've, they've developed, um, even in the X-risk space, clear pathways for how you get accidental release of nuclear weapons, terror, terror, um, uh, terrorist-induced nuclear um, weapons or whatever the case might be, accidents and, um, and uh, miscalculations. So there's been a lot of work in the nuclear space to really break that down and there's, um, what are they called, like tree diagram things where you sort of have each sort of pathway articulated. And to the, to the point, I think some people have already calculated as well, like the percentage likelihood for each of those pathways at each point. So that work's already been done in some sense, but doing it in some, for some of the other risks that we face, I think is gonna be really critical because um, there's, I, can't, I can't see us doing AI policy for, or for, for any other policy for that matter without just doing AI policy at large. Um, it's going to be, well, what's the specific mitigations or uh, reduction efforts we're going to do for accidental uh, um, release of AI systems or, um, you know, like superintelligence's own sort of case, but, or even what are the sort of processes we're going to put, put in place to, to minimise the risk of AI exacerbating the use of nuclear weapons. So we have to break it down at that level. And that makes your theory of impact much more clear because you've already got the pathway there and then you can say, okay, this policy will reduce this point of the pathway. This policy will reduce this point of the pathway. It's not a, it's a slightly vague answer, I know, but um, and and I haven't, I, I won't, I don't know AI 
policy um, and the AR space well enough to sort of define it at that, at that level. But I think if we don't break it down, um, those pathways down, it's going to be really hard for, to design the, the, the policies in a way that will actually mitigate the risk. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I think that whenever we think about like a whole existential risk, like how do we, like how do we improve AI safety? It's such a large question that it's very much, how do we start kind of thing. So yeah, I think that whole thing of breaking it down so that you can enact a specific policy that. The one thing I'll add as well is um, the, the challenge and, and Aristo sort of talked to this yesterday in the panel discussion. One of the challenges we have specifically for AI policy, but I think in tech, sort of any future based risk is, um, is I think we, if we don't, we have a really tough time defining the problem. And like, it's already tough enough to define what the sort of research problems and challenges are for AI. Um, and we've got obviously the brightest minds thinking about that. To define what the policy problem for AI, it becomes even more difficult. So on top of the sort of theory of impact sort of design that you need to make or argument you need to make. I think there's a, a bit of work that needs to be done around, let's define exactly what the policy problem is because that's, uh, I think that will also reveal its own um, opportunities in going, okay, uh, how, by defining the problem, then we can start thinking about what are the specific instruments that we can use and then you can start going, okay, this instrument will be applicable for X or Y scenario in this in these ways, and we can start potentially even estimating how impactful those those instruments will be. By what percentage will they reduce the risk? Blah blah blah. So I think defining the pro policy problem is a big one for me, at least for AI. But I think more generally on um, any problem that is doesn't exist right now, right? Like we don't, as far as I can tell, we don't have we don't face AI existential risk right now. Um, uh, we don't necessarily face uh, um, sort of a biological uh, existential risk right now. So it becomes, uh, particularly from a uh, bioengineering and synthetic biology, so how do you define problems that don't exist right now? Like that's a really hard policy problem and it's, it's very hard to convince policymakers to care about a problem that doesn't exist right now. Yeah, it's hard to convince politicians sometimes to care about pol problems that exist, that do exist right now kind of thing. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so we've got another question from the audience. Uh, the example of food policy not being owned very well by the government seems to explain a lot of the sticking points for good food policy. Does this mean we need political will or ministerial direction to create new departments for this systemic change? And I guess this kind of relates to something I was thinking about, which is for existential risk, I guess, is it better for it to remain a quiet problem that we're quietly working behind the scenes or should we turn it into a large movement and something that has the will of the people behind it when we're demanding for it? Well, yeah, it's a good question. It's a tough one. Um, for food policy specifically, um, I don't think we need. Uh, I don't think we need new institutions necessarily, or new organisations. And, and this is not just for food policy. For any real issue, necessarily, uh, we don't necessarily need to create a brand new architecture or, or bureaucracy to solve the, for the problem. But it's really giving one political leader especially, but even at least uh, a senior official, the you are responsible for this issue. I was speaking to a, um, a, a year or so ago, um, speaking to a former senior, um, he was responsible essentially for intelligence in the Department of Energy in the US, which is the um, responsible for the nuclear, pro nuclear weapons program in the US. So, you know, um, a really important and, um, and high pressure job. And as he was leaving, he had a one-on-one -on -one meeting, uh, he was recalling this one-on-one -on -one meeting he had with the president at the time and said to the president, um, go and ask your staff who is responsible for um, biological weapons. And, I'm, and essentially the, the sort of implicit response being, you will find that there is no one person, right? And it was just a sort of a, a microcosm of like, can you ask you know, if you, could, if you were to go to your most senior official and say who's responsible for X and they can't answer that, that's, it's not necessarily a problem, but it's, it's not great, right? Um, it's not a great uh, outcome. And having that one person responsible or at least one part of the, of the bureaucracy is, is responsible is um, a first, a really a 
potentially a really important step, especially an issue that is so cross-cutting. So I think like AI is going to suffer from this problem. Climate change is from a policy perspective. Climate change policy is going to potentially suffer from this problem. Things that are so cross-cutting across government, across society, across the economy, um, they then they go owned by everyone and then no one owns it, right? So I think food policy is going to is is uh, a really sort of quintessential case of this and. Um, I'm going to promote a little bit of my own work in this. Uh, recently, uh, last year, and we'll be re-releasing re a publication under the Commission for the Human Future, which I'm part of, where we did a, a food policy report in Australia. And this is exactly the argument we make. We say we need strategic um, and a cohesive food policy in Australia that is owned by a specific part of government. We proposed a, a senior official in the Department of agriculture that makes the most sense like as i said in my talk they're not the only people who own food policy but at least you give them that responsibility you know a depsec responsible for food um they could be called depsec food i don't care what it's called but they are there's got food in the title maybe you even make a, a a junior minister who's responsible for food policy um is also an option uh and um that's a starting point to go that person owns it that part of the of the bureaucracy owns it and then it, it's a signal as well to the rest of the rest of government to say this is your center point for food policy and food is really tough as well because it's mostly owned at the state like there's a lot of food policy so to speak is owned at the state level so there's going to be a lot of commonwealth state coordination that needs to be done as well so um, the UK and Canada have a national have, have done have developed a national food strategy um, so they're you know uh, already sort of thinking about it in a whole of government and in a national sense. Um, there's, there's no reason we can't do it here. Oh, I'm sorry. There's plenty of reasons why it's not being done, particularly sort of political forces and the economic forces behind, um, behind agriculture. But um, there's no reason from a policy perspective we can't achieve that. And yeah, it's a real challenge for any of those cross-cutting issues and something we need to really think about when it comes to... Because all of the... A lot of the issues we care about are really pervasive across government. They're really complex issues and there's not necessarily going to be one part of government that cleanly owns it. Um, and But the response necessarily isn't, let's just start a new organisation. Um, if anything, I, I lean towards that's all often going to cause more issues than it solves. Um, I think just giving it to the most logical part of government. The one final point I'll make on this is, uh, I'm not sure if this is a, uh, always the best response, but uh, in at least in the Australian model, when there's been a, a, a cross-cutting issue that isn't being handled by government, it often, there'll be a task force set up in PMNC and they say, you're responsible for developing this. And then it gets siphoned off into the sort of most logical uh, part of government. So uh, cyber, and uh, cyber has been one recently, like, well, like maybe five or 10 years ago, uh, they got siphoned off to home affairs. I think when uh, counterterrorism obviously became a really big issue, um, uh, that would, it was housed in uh, the coordinator for CT was within the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet and obviously it's been siphoned off to home affairs. So sometimes that's a possible option is that no one quite owns it. So then almost by, uh, by implication, the prime minister owns it because then they're the sort of ultimate responsibility and housing it in PMNC could be the starting point for then um, building it out, giving it the uh, weight it needs, giving it the support it needs, and then you sort of farm it off. Great. Thank you for that. Um, we've got another question from the audience. Politicians represent constituents. Do you see a greater challenge in convincing politicians directly to care about these issues or to convince citizens that these long-term concerns need to be considered in hand with their current needs and demands. So like from an analogy, it seems to be really hard to make Australia care about foreign aid because people outside of Australia don't hold a political vote. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's, if there's things we can do to Im increase and improve um, the public's uh, salience around these issues, obviously that's like, uh, for the most part, that's a good thing. Um, at the same time, I don't think we, we, we need to or should wait for that. Um, obviously, on the issues that we care about, that might not happen for a long time. So, uh, so I think it's really useful. I was, rather than just saying, let's do a bit of everything, I think it's about when, when do those opportunities arise to shape policy and political thought um, around an issue in absence of... Um, 
you know, mass public support. And um, policy windows, particularly directly after a, um, a, a instigating event, is is one of those really critical policy windows for us, uh, especially around existential risk and GCRs in, in more broadly. These the the types of events that will we 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 may never get enough public support to to. Uh, in sort of implement policy around those issues, but there will be p times when there will be enough political momentum, right? And you know, as an example, as a sort of silly example, I like to sort of point to, and we'll go back to food policy again. Um, I don't know if people remember, maybe like four or five years ago, there was the, the needles in the strawberry in, uh, incident supply, and so and and it was like you know, it was like. F f it's not great, but it was, at the end of the day, it was like five needles in five strawberries, right? Like it wasn't an, a national crisis, but it triggered a whole bunch of public uh, outcry and then obviously political and, and policy um, direction around it. And f uh, as I recall, the, poli the policy response was, we're going to do a review into essentially, the terms of reference was essentially needles in strawberries. Like it was such a narrowly defined terms of reference, right? I'm being, exaggerating slightly for effect, but it was essentially that small, right? Whereas w why not use that as an opportunity to go, we need to improve food security in the broadest possible conception. It, obviously food security is much bigger than needles in strawberries, but that's an opportunity that arose in that moment for those four or five days. It was really on, it was in the front pages, blah, blah, blah. That's the time to use that momentum to go, before people stop caring, to go, hey, government, you need to care about food security more broadly in terms of, um, in terms of uh, food, food resilience during a catastrophe, blah, blah, like all of those um, sort of potential use cases that we might see. And so... Those are the times I, I really see precipitating events as a really important way for us to to um, shape policy because you don't get you have the public support but only very for a very short period and if you're not ready for that moment you'll miss it right if you don't have the policy proposals ready to go if you don't have the political connections ready to go you're going to miss that potentially miss that opportunity um, and obviously COVID has been like the the biggest policy window on pandemics we could ever get um, and. Uh, that comes as its own challenge, whereas it's the, the precipitating event has, has, has been going for years. So getting enough um, attention to do more long-term strategic change as opposed to response and recovery type things, that's its own sort of unique challenge. But I really think th those are the moments to take advantage of. In the meantime, in the background, obviously, we're working on building the public sort of understanding and awareness um, around these sorts of issues. Great, thank you. Um, I think we've only got time for one more question. Um, I've, got, I've got one in mind, but just in case, is anyone in the audience, if you'd like to raise your hand and we can bring a microphone to you if you'd like to ask a question. Okay, great. Um, oh, not great, I mean, it's, I just feel neutral about that. Um, <laughs> so I guess, I guess one thing I was wondering about with the um, case of the asteroids, right? It seems like that's an amazing example of governments caring much more than we would think about long-term risks and, and, and doing a lot in, in a positive way to kind of um, reduce that, that long-term risk. What do you think it was about asteroids that kind of gave, gave government the, the will of the people, the mandate to, um, to, to institute that policy? Was it just random? Was it because we were obsessed with space at the time? Or uh, like, what do, you, what do you think were the features of asteroids and that, that made that happen. No, it's a great question, and it's a it's a um, a good ex another good example of the precipitating events. So there was a bunch of things that happened in the '90s, uh, the early to mid '90s, that sort of really triggered uh, uh, um, the public and political consciousness around asteroids. There was a Schumacher Levy Levy um, collision, uh, comet collision with Jupiter, which was the biggest uh, collision we've seen in our solar system. Um, and we were able to observe it in real time. And obviously um, there was a lot of sort of political, fa sorry, public fascination around that event. Um, so that sort of raised its, uh, uh, the consciousness of political leadership around it. Um, there was the, obviously all the sort of um, research that was coming around, around the extinction of dinosaurs and um, the, um, when they found the um, uh, the crater in Mexico, like it, it, it there was a, definitely a, a massive fascination around asteroids at the time. Uh, in 1998, I think it, this is given weight, more weight than it deserves, but people like to comment that deep impact and uh, what was the other one? Armageddon. 
Armageddon came out uh, in, in 1998, which is exactly when the legislation was implemented. Th I think that's given a little bit more weight than it deserves. Um, but it definitely was a, probably a factor. I mean, I was doing a little bit of the um, time scale on this. And so in, I think it was M May or June 1998 when, uh, when the legislation or that there was, there was sort of essentially considering the legislation, uh, Deep Impact came out around May and um, Armageddon came out in July. So it's definitely in the atmosphere and, uh, and Armageddon, the, the trailer for it was during the Super Bowl in January. So like, I, like the whole of the US would have seen, you know, this, you know. Uh, so it was definitely, I think, in the atmosphere, I, but I wouldn't give, I think other people have given way too much credit to those, you know, movies being the sort of transformative effect that they had on the sort of political consciousness. There was already a lot of momentum there. Um, the, the, um, congressional um, committee that was um, considering it had been considering it for a long time. So it was definitely on the radar. But all these events sort of added up. Um, and uh, I think that's, uh, it sort of goes to show that if we're not in a position to take advantage of those events when they, they come up, and, uh, you know, to the point around evolution and sustaining the policy, when the, um, and I don't know how to say the, the name, but it was that, um, that asteroid or um, that hit, in Russia in 2013, Kablitsky or something like that. Um, that were, that triggered you know that triggered more congressional discussion about it. So like even even once the policy's in, precipitating events then give you an opportunity to go. Okay, how do we improve on this? How do we build on it um, for the next type of ev of event? So um, yeah, I'm, I'm a really I'm really sort of honed in on. Uh, I think people focus a lot on Overton windows at, at large. It's like, we need to get the public to be accepting of this as a problem before the politicians do. Yes, that's true. But, that, but in absence of that, we've got these little pockets that we can take advantage of. We just need to be ready when they, when they arrive. Yep. They, I think that definitely echoes your earlier statement that, you know, if we start on this now, then like maybe every day we start on it, we, we've got a better chance to kind of um, take advantage of the opportunity well, if there is political will to, to get to work on these problems. Um, thank you so much for coming to speak to us, Rumpton. Uh, it's been a fascinating talk. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm.